Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, we're continuing on now, picking up and back, going back to our study in Paul's second letter to Timothy. We're in the second chapter, and we'll be starting at the 19th verse. You know, we've been away for... Um, We've been away from this study for over a month, about a month and a half, as Alice and I were traveling and ministering overseas. So we're just glad to be back yes, and glad to be back in this particular word. Hallelujah. So as I said, we're going to be starting in Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 18, 19, all right, right after Mark prays and asks for God's blessing on our time together. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for your wonderful living word. Yes. And just do dose us with, with your love and with the wisdom from it. And we just pray that we can spread it around. Amen. Amen. And you can spread it. Yes. And you should spread it because Christianity has to be viral. Yes. It should be contagious. Pray mm -hmm. that somebody catches Christianity from you. You learned that on the trip. Yes. <laughs> well, all right. Um, as I said, we're going to start at verse 19, but I want to just refresh our memory here because for from verses 16, 17, and 18, we were talking about men who had gone astray from the truth, and they were introducing error into the church that mm -hmm. created a lot of problems, yes. right? But in verse 19, Paul says, nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. The firm foundation of God stands. Nobody's going to come along and change that. No. You know, this is what, this is what Jesus promised. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. That's Isaiah 28, verse 26, or verse 16, rather. So God, God has promised that there's a firm foundation to his church that he is building, right? Because he made that promise, he delivered, right? And in Mark 12, 10, Jesus said, Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. And let me read what Paul wrote in Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 20 and 21. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. So, you know, there are a lot of people, there's more people in error than there are in truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the way is wide and easy that leads to destruction. Right. It is narrow and straight that leads to life. But the Lord knows who those who are his. Isn't that what it said here? Yes. The Lord knows those who are his. Because he searches hearts. Well, and also, our names, those saved by the shed blood of the Lamb, were written in heaven in the book of life. Before the foundations of the earth. So we rejoice in one of the greatest promises for the children of God. This is Romans 8, 29 and 30. And I promise you this is one of the greatest promises. Because he promised it. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. So that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. I'll give you a second to get over your excitement. Because if that doesn't excite you, we need to get excited by that. Because that is the great promise that God, the potter, is molding us, shaping us, and bringing us into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. So let's let's move along here. Okay, Second Timothy, chapter two. I'm going to read verses twenty and twenty one now. Mm -hmm. Now, in a large house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, 
sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. That's what we want to be. That's what we want. But we're vessels. Yes. All right? We're, we're vessels. Earthen vessels. Vessels exist solely for the purpose of carrying something mm -hmm. or transporting something. Yes. Isn't that right? Yes. It may be a ship carrying passengers or cargo. It may be a blood vessel inside of you carrying life-giving blood throughout the body. But the vessel is about whatever it carries. Okay? We have this treasure, Paul wrote. We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. We are earthen vessels filled with a treasure. It's not about the package. That's what, that's what Paul's talking about here when he writes to Timothy. It's not about the package. It's about the content. Which What's in the package? Me, makes me think about the ark. What, what was in the ark? You're talking about the ark of the covenant, yes, aren't you? The ark yes, of you. The I thought you might be. Yes. Yeah. Well, what was in the ark of the covenant? The showbread. Mm -hmm. It was the word, the tablets, right? Yes. When we were there. Mm -hmm. And the staff. Uh, I don't know about the staff. There's three things. What's in us? Okay. Uh, and on it sat the, the mercy seat. Right. But it was the bread, the manna. Mm -hmm. Right? And the word. The word. The point is, the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant is gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many people are focused on it today. Yeah, you know, trying to find, trying to find it. And if you want to see the Ark of the Covenant, here we are. it's right here. That's us. Because that living God lives inside of me. That living God lives inside of you. The if indeed you have God accepted life from him. Us. Yeah. Right? His word has been written on the tablets of our heart. Mm -hmm. Okay? We carry the bread of life. We carry Jesus. That's the treasure that we carry, right? Yes. Yes. So what's important in our lives is not us, not the vessel, yeah. but the treasure within. Mm -hmm. It's not about the package, but about the content. If, if you were to receive a phone call from a law firm and they say, well, you have a long lost relative that you don't even know about and he has passed and left you a million dollars or a billion or whatever, a lot of money in his will. Uh, we've put a check in the mail sending you this, sending you the money. When you receive that envelope in the mail, Mm -hmm. that says so-and-so law firm that you just talked to. Mm -hmm. Are you not going to open it? I would think so. Let me ask you this. If you knew that there was a zillion dollar, I see I've gone from million to a billion. <laughs> to, if you knew that there was a zillion dollar check in there, do you think that you might tear the envelope to get to the check? Most likely. <laughs> because what's important is the check, not the envelope. We are only the envelope carrying the presence of Christ Jesus. That's right. We have to come to understand that in our lives. Yes. Because what is important about our lives is the life in yes. us. All right? Amen. Unless, of course, you like the envelope so much that you'll <laughs> choose not to damage it. You can steam it open if you really No, you're not going to damage it at all. You don't want to do anything to damage just it. Just leave it alone. So you're just going to keep it intact. Yeah and not open it. How many people are doing that? Well, the fact is, God is so presented. many people are focused on the vessel, mm -hmm. focused on the envelope, focused on the package, right. rather than what's inside. Right. We have nothing, you know? We have nothing. We have we nothing have to nothing. offer people. Nothing. Whoa. You, there's none good, not even one. You have nothing good in you. That's right. Except Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what you have to offer people. Nothing of yourself, right? The treasure is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what it says in Colossians 1.27. Not even our word, it's his word. And it has me. I mean, you know, I don't want to get too far off yes. track here, but the fact is Jesus said he didn't do anything that the Father hadn't shown him to do. He didn't say anything that the Father hadn't told him to, to say. So he could say, when I think it was Thomas asked him, Oh, but when we see the Father? No, show me. He said, said show me the Father. Show, me show the us Father. the Father. 
And Jesus, have I been with you so long? You don't know? If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Why? Because Christ was hid in God. Christ was hid in God. That's what it says, Colossians 3, 3. So, because it's not about, it wasn't about Jesus. It was about the Father in him and that work in him and through him, right? If anyone claim, back to the verse here, okay? If anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor. Yes. We want to be, we are a vessel, but we want to be a vessel for honor. These things, that cleanses himself from these things, what are these things? These things are the wrangling about words, mm -hmm. worldly and empty chatter, going astray from the truth, wrongly, wrongly dividing the word. That's what it talked about just preceding this. Yes. Those are the things that we need to cleanse ourselves from. We're to be vessels to carry Jesus the living water that springs up to eternal life. Isn't this what Jesus told the woman at the well in John chapter 4? Yes. He is, he is the, the living water, the water that leads to life, right? But let me go back to Jeremiah the prophet and read something that he said. In Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13, he said, God spoke to Jeremiah and said, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And a cistern was a container for water. Right. And he said, Jeremiah is saying, that God is speaking through Jeremiah, saying the people have rejected me. So what they have done is they, instead of making you know, that fountain of living water, active in their lives they had made for themselves cisterns but they were broken cisterns that can hold no water if we're to be useful to the master prepared for a good work we have to make sure we're not leaking the things of god sin unrepented sin in our lives puts cracks in the cistern it corrupts the earthen vessels and dishonors the potter I mean, should that not be obvious mm -hmm. to all of us? And, and if that happens, it becomes useless, not ever having been formed to be, because we, we were never formed to be just a decoration, but we were formed to carry the knowledge of God and Jesus into every place. 2 Corinthians 2.14. That's our purpose, is to bring those living waters, to bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. So in order to do that, he continues on in the next verse, verse 22, and says, Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. All right, how do we keep, how do we be that vessel of honor? He's telling us here, flee from youthful lusts, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Flee from youthful lusts. You know, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, and I'm going to read verse 11. He said, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. Youthful lusts. And he said, going on in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he said, Brethren, do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Hebrews 12.1. Okay, remember the wrangling about words, the worldly and empty chatter, going astray from the truth? So Paul writes to the Ephesians and says, But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. We've got to grow up. God is looking for maturity in our lives. Now, the day that you were saved, you may not be mature. And you, you know, like me, I didn't know the word at all. I had grown up in a religion that did not connect me to the word of God, right? It kept it from you. So I had, I had that immaturity in me. I didn't know the word. But I tell you what, the spirit of God, the spirit of truth, was in me yes. and things began to happen, but you got to grow up. You have to come to a maturity, all right? Mm -hmm. 
It is indeed, as James said, James 3, 4, the tongue, like the rudder of a ship, that steers the course that we will take. He said, do not speak as a child. Right? Right. <clears throat> That's that. We have to control our tongue. We have to train our tongue to speak righteousness. Jesus Christ said, John 12, he didn't speak anything. He didn't hear from the Father. If you're not hearing from the Father, shut up your face. Don't say anything. You'd be better off don't say anything. Don't speak until you hear. And when we hear, obey. You know, Paul said that when he was a child, he used to speak like a child, think like a child. Well, wait a minute. So he's saying that he was speaking before he thought. Yes. Right? That, That's what he said. But more importantly, he was speaking before he heard. Mm -hmm. Because if we're to do all things in faith, and without faith it's impossible to please God, and faith comes by hearing, if you're speaking without hearing from God, you know what you're doing? You're doing what it says in Proverbs 3, 5, not to do. And that's you're leaning on your own understanding. Well, get us into big trouble. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, all of the scriptures just come together and testify of hopeless. Peter wrote in the beginning of uh, uh, his, in his first letter in the fourth chapter, verse 11, in the beginning of that verse, he said, whoever speaks is to do so as the one who is speaking the utterances of God. Mm -hmm. If, if God wouldn't say it, don't you say it. Right. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Now, let me ask you a question. Did you notice by chance that happiness is not in that list? Right. Neither is joy. Well, that, that, but regardless. Yeah, regardless. And that's, <clears throat> did you notice that, that happiness is not in the list? Right. All right. He's not, you don't have to pursue joy. Joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit that God gives you. Happiness is not. Okay, but happiness is not in that list. <clears throat> righteousness, you, we're called to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. The United States Constitution states clearly that the pursuit of happiness along with life and liberty is one of the inalienable or unalienable rights granted to man by their creator. That's what Thomas Jefferson wrote. That's what Franklin attested to. Why are you making faces? What creator? No, it's not. Find it in the Bible. <laughs> oh, well, that's my point. You can't find it in the Bible. All right? But that was ratified by all of the founding fathers of this country. And that, I, I'm going to tell you, that's only one of the scriptural heresies that's right. that exists in the Constitution <clears throat> of the United States. And heresy indeed it is. You see, they wrote that. Thomas Jefferson wrote this. It was, a, it, was a, a, it was approved by a panel of five. Jefferson, Franklin, and I don't know, the other three others. And they didn't check with their creator. No, they did not. They're talking about this is the rights, this is the inalienable rights. So that means this is rights that you're given that belong to you that nobody can take away. That you have the right to pursue life, liberty, and the, you know, and happiness, right? They didn't check with their creator. Jesus said, Mark 8, I'm going to read verses 34 and 35. He said, and he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. And then in Matthew chapter 10, verses 38 and 39, he said, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. In the gospel of John, he said, he who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. Happiness is about self. Happiness is about self. Yet Jesus calls us to die to self. Deny self. And we're, we're going to talk a lot more about that in the next chapter when we get into chapter 3. And then in verse 23, he goes on, But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, 
knowing that they produce quarrels. Refuse foolish and ignorant speculations. Mm. Now, speculation, you may not say that in your translation. I'm, I just read that from the New American Standard Version. In the King James, it says unlearned questions. In the English Standard Version, it says, and this is instead of speculations, right? It talks about controversies. Mm. The New King James says disputes. The NIV says stupid arguments. Speculation involves uncertainty. Right. It's guessing. Um, well, speculation by definition involves uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Okay. However, Peter wrote, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence, 2 Peter 1, 3. There shouldn't be any uncertainty in our life. Or if there are things that we are uncertainty of, you don't want to get into quarrels with other people about them. Because God has revealed the truth. We have within us the spirit of truth. This is why in Romans 14 it talks about, you know, one person may believe this, another person, get over it. Okay? As long as we are agreed on the gospel. Okay? So maybe the topic that is bringing about the speculation is not important. Otherwise, God would have given us. Get to the root. Don't let unimportant things cause quarrels. Because as the next verse says, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong. Quarrelsome. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? That's, that's the word of God. That's James 4.1. That's where quarrels come from. They don't come from Jesus. They don't come from the Holy Spirit. They don't come from God the Father. They don't come from the word. The source is your pleasures. Or you're not in agreement. And your pleasures are about yourself. So that brings us back to the enlightenment. And this was where it was from, the enlightenment. The enlightenment principle of the pursuit of happiness. To please yourself, your pleasures. Right, right, right. It's almost always about self. Mm -hmm. What the Lord gives us, which is so much greater than happiness, is joy, a mm -hmm. fruit of the Holy Spirit abiding in us. Now, see, that's the difference is you don't have to pursue joy. No, it's there. Joy has been placed inside of you. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You can't do anything to create joy. Okay? An no, orange no. doesn't make itself grow from an orange tree. Okay? So we, we just have to understand that, what, what did it say? Think about the, what the verse said, right? Because it is the fruit of the Holy Spirit that not only brings joy, but brings kindness and patience. Yes, now, gentleness. Well, yeah, but it said in the verse we're reading, it says, be the kind. Lord's bondservant must be not be quarrelsome, but be kind. Right. Fruit of the Holy Spirit. Patient. Patient. Fruit of the Holy Spirit. Gentle. All right. It's gentleness. Yeah. That's yeah. The fruit of it's the all Spirit. about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So Jesus said, "You will know them by their fruit." So if these things are not evident in the life of a person, that is evidence of a problem, right? So he the the task he has equipped us for and called us to. It says with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. They may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. With gentleness correcting. This brings us back to speaking the truth in love. Right. We're not called to try and win debates or to prove that we're right, because we're not. We're not right. The word is right. It's only his word that can bring correction. All right? Amen. We're only the vessel. We're the, we are the clay jar that the treasure is in. It's not about us. His word, right? We can't even do repentance unless God, God grants, grants it to us. So, again, because it's coming shortly in this letter, mm -hmm. the next chapter, Paul wrote, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, 
for correction, for training in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. So correction has to be done with the word of God. You're not to argue with people. You're not to you know, condemn. You are to bring the word of God because that has the power to encourage. That has the power to correct. It has the power to reprove. And most of all, this is God's plan to train us in righteousness. God's breath, all scripture is God breathed. Yes. God's breath is the source of life. Yes. It's the source of life. It says, I mean, Genesis 2 7. And by the way, if you think that this is a fable, you better get on your face before God. Mm. All right? This is the truth. This is the true story of creation. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Amen. Genesis 2 7. Amen. That is the truth. And if you think it is a fable, you better come to your senses. Come to your senses. Your opinions have no value. Not at all. I'm telling you the truth. I'm not trying to insult you. And I'm not trying to offend you. And if you love God's word, you can't take offense. No. Your opinions have no value. Right. And they will very often only result in quarrels and division. Right, right. If you desire to see and walk in the path of righteousness and encourage others to do the same, remember this. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. That's what guides us in that path. Yes. He has made a promise to lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. His word is a lamp that shows us that path. You see, we started by recognizing that we're only the vessels, mm -hmm. not the treasure. And the true treasure that we should bring into the life of others is this. God's love. For the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, Romans 5, 5, and God's life-giving word. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds. I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Hebrews 18, but that's quoting from Jeremiah. The point of the fact is, if, if, if indeed what's coming forth from your mouth is what's in the abundance of your heart, it should be the word of God. It should be the love of God. That's right. And then people will escape from the snare of the devil. That's what the verse says. Mm -hmm. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. Mm -hmm. Psalm 91 verses 1 through 3. God will deliver you from the snare. Satan is out to get you. But he's been disarmed. He's been disarmed. He comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. But he was disarmed. He was publicly disarmed when Christ was publicly displayed on the cross. That's right. The word of the cross is still important, let me tell you that. Amen. So the trap that Satan sets is not on the path of righteousness. He's not allowed on that path. Mm -hmm. He can't get on that path. He can't get on that path. Mm -mm. He has to put it off on that where? On that wide and easy way, off to the side. When many lanes continually being, are being added. So he has to talk you into choosing to change ways and get on that easy way. Because it says, having been held captive. And when you were dead in your trespass and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Okay? Before you were saved, you were enslaved to Satan. That's what it says, Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. So let me just, that, does that, our creator did not give us an inalienable right to life. You, he no, did not give you a right. No. He, you don't have a right to life. No. He offered you the gift of life. That's right. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever will. God has offered you the gift. You don't have a right to it. No. You don't deserve it. No. It's the free gift of God. It's a gift, not a right. And that will lead us to do his will. You will either choose to do God's will 
leading to life, mm -hmm. or you will indeed do the enemy's will, leading to death. Jesus said that no man can serve two masters. He will hate the one and love the other. Matthew 6, 24, right? Mm -hmm. But everyone, everyone, that's so, us, that's you, everyone will serve a master. That's right. Everyone will serve a master. We'll serve God or we'll serve mammon. So let me end on these words from Joshua. Choose, this, choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me and my household, we yes. will serve the Lord God. Hallelujah. Well, listen, if you have any comments or questions, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. But be back here next week, because then we're going to talk about the perilous last days. Yes. yes. And that's an important topic, I'll tell you what. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your love that you've shed abroad in us, that you've poured into our hearts. We thank you for the love that you demonstrated, that you publicly displayed in your son, Christ Jesus, that we would have the gift of life. Lord, help us to be life-bearing Christians, carrying your presence, carrying your word, carrying your love into every place that we go. Lord, use our lives for the glory of your name. We just praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. Well, till next time, God bless you. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mind.